Hello and welcome to Haystack Live, our regular search and relevance meetup. And today we're very pleased to have Brandon Chan of DeepSet AI to talk about evolving from keyword to neural search. So uh, we'll have a chance for questions. Uh, once Brandon's talking, if you wouldn't mind muting your microphone, uh, just to reduce background noise, we may have to mute it for you if, if you don't do that. Um, Brandon will talk and then afterwards we'll have a chance for questions. Please put your questions in the Zoom chat and then I will ask them on your behalf um, to keep things tidy. Um, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll go like that. So the uh, other things to mention here, we have our usual OSC trainings. We have some, just launched some dates for February and March next year. So do check those out. If you'd like to learn some uh, relevance engineering skills or some LTR. Um, uh, thanks to everyone who came to our Haystack conference a couple of months ago. That was a great success. And all the videos for that are online on our YouTube account, as will be the video from today's Haystack. Um, also, I'd like to mention that we are looking for more talks for Haystack Live. So if you have uh, a talk you'd like to give, uh, please do go over to the Haystack website. That's haystackconf.com. And look on the right-hand side, you'll see a sign-up link for a form where you can enter your talk. Uh, we have another talk planned for later this year, but we'd love to set up some more for the next few weeks. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Brandon Chan. Brandon, are you ready? Yes, I am. Brilliant. Let me just stop my share and uh, random. OK, excellent. Um, well, if everyone can see that, then I'm going to start here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here today. And also thank you very much, uh, Charlie and everyone at uh, Open Source Connections for, for letting me speak today to you all. I'm actually really excited about this. And uh, yeah, today I really want to talk a little bit about um, how we got to where we are now with search, how keyword search um, is really kind of the backbone, unless it's a really, really strong, really standard way of doing search. But we actually have a very new way of performing uh, certain types of search as well uh, in this kind of neural search domain. And I want to talk a little bit about these two different styles, where they fit in, how they are used, and um, yeah. I want to give a little bit of an overview on that. Um, just to give a sense of um, where we're coming from. So uh, I'm a machine learning engineer at DeepSet and uh, we at DeepSet are sitting somewhere in between research and industry. So um, we've always been very well connected to the happenings in the NLP sphere and the machine learning sphere. And we've really been noticing um, a very strong surge in deep learning based NLP. And uh, that's really kind of manifested in terms of um, a big trend of training powerful language models, which have some sort of modeling of the distribution of words and can kind of do practical things with language. We've seen a lot of these language models in the form of transformer models. Transformers are a type of architecture um, that have proven to be really, really powerful and really, really effective in a lot of different tasks. And we've also seen a lot of interest in a task called question answering, which I'm gonna explain a little bit more later in my talk. But we saw all this activity and we also saw a lot of interest from industry to see how these technologies can be applied to their needs, to their search needs and to their, um, yeah, to their tech stack, how it fits into their tech stack. And that's where we've been positioning ourselves uh, as deep set. We've been really trying to bring the latest research to our industry partners. And for that reason, we have been focusing on building out our, uh, our own open source repository. Happens also to be called Haystack. Um, and it's our open source uh, natural language processing framework that is very much um, tailored towards industrial search. So as I said, it's very important to us that this framework stays open source. Um, and uh, one of the design decisions that we made in creating this was to have a very modular style of framework whereby uh, pipelines and the way that you route data is very customizable. And um, to also differentiate it a little bit from other machine learning frameworks you might know out there, um, Haystack is really designed to be an end-to-end -end system. Uh, we're not just interested in the models or a single model. We're interested in chaining models together. We're interested in how you store your data. We're interested in how you deploy this and how you uh, serve the models in the end of the system. 
And at this point, I just want, kind of also want to mention uh, that we're hiring currently. So um, if you are a senior, or you're, or you're, sorry, a developer advocate or backend engineer, um, we'd be very happy to talk to you. Uh, we're hiring currently for a senior developer advocate and a senior backend engineer with um, a focus on SaaS. A little bit about myself. So yeah, as I mentioned, I'm a machine learning engineer. Um, I actually come from a slightly different background. I've actually always been very interested in languages. I did my bachelor's in classical linguistics at Cambridge. And then I did my master's in computational linguistics uh, at Stanford. Um, the way that I see things, I think that NLP is a really, really interesting area to be in right now. Uh, I was actually talking to Charlie just before this about how um, it's really kind of that the community of the, NL the NLP community has actually had to uh, reach out and kind of communicate a lot with people in search and in, inf in information retrieval. And I think actually this sort of collaboration between these two fields, this confluence of two areas has been a really nice development in recent years. Um, and I think with that kind of collaboration, I see that the technology that we're building in NLP and in information retrieval and in search uh, is gonna become ubiquitous. I can see that uh, a lot of these models that are used in NLP could become something that's really just relied upon as industry standards, the way that uh, everyone knows what SQL is. Um, language technology also will quite fundamentally change the way that we interact with machines. I think that one way to think about language is that it's a certain type of interface towards interacting with programs to interacting with your data. Um, there are certain languages that people are very familiar with now, various kinds of programming languages. But I think that with NLP and with language technologies, uh, this barrier is gonna, it's gonna take much less um, specific knowledge to be able to perform more complex queries, that we can start doing this in natural language. And I hope by the end of this talk, I can convince you that's the case, that we have already a lot of the technology that will make it much, much easier to interact with, with your data. And um, I'm very convinced that also open source software is the way that's going to let us make this happen. Um, I, I know this firsthand because uh, being in, in, in contact with the community of Haystack, I can really see there's so much enthusiasm, there's so much desire, there's so much practical need also in the open source community uh, to solve big problems together, to present good solutions that are general and also uh, really effective. And um, yeah, I'm just actually just really happy to be part of this open source community, um, which I'm sure a lot of you are also part of. So today I wanna break, uh, break up my talk into four different sections. I wanna talk a little bit just about keyword search. Um, I wanna talk about how that compares to neural search and what's possible there. Then um, I wanna talk about our repo, uh, DeepSets Haystack, uh, the search framework of ours and show what's possible there to give an idea of, yeah, what you can already get started with. And then I want to look a little bit to the future, look forward a bit and um, see what the future of search might look like. So I want to start off with keyword search, which is something that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, but just as a refresher, um, keyword search is yeah used often in the context of trying to find documents. Maybe you have a large set of documents and you're storing them in a database somewhere. And maybe you're performing a query like members Sonic Youth. And so a keyword matching system would go through all your documents and highlight cases where some of these words pop up. And you can see on the left here, I've got a document about Sonic Youth and you can see in bold uh, words that match the query. And this is kind of a nice start, um, but there's a lot more we can do here as well. For example, we can um, account for synonyms or account for words like inflected words and so on. So you can actually see if you're, um, if you kind of notice here, the query has the word members, but actually we also match for member. Um, so there's a little bit of flexibility there, but we can also go a little bit further here by implementing weighting. Not all of these matches are as important as each other. So uh, there actually might be a lot more documents out there which are about bands and feature the word members. So you don't wanna just return all the, all the documents which say members. Uh, Sonic Youth is actually a much more important keyword here. And uh, we might want to weight that much more highly. And that's once we start incorporating this kind of idea, uh, we're already very close towards these other algorithms, TFIDF and BM25, 
which are still readily used, still really, really effective. And in many cases, um, yeah, definitely like the go-to option um, for performing document search. But I wanna move forward here and introduce a new style of search, neural search. And uh, to give an idea of what's possible here with neural search, I'm actually gonna switch over to a demo that's been implemented using our framework Haystack. And uh, I'm gonna go to this. So can everyone see this? Can someone maybe just either say yes or write a message? Just want to make sure. Okay, I see a thumbs up from a um, from someone in the crowd. So I'm gonna go forward at this point. Um, yeah, this is the Haystack demo. And uh, we've actually loaded a lot of pages from uh, the fandom pages of Harry Potter. And uh, with this, we can start actually not just doing queries the way that we saw before, but actually asking full questions. And I can show you how this works. So let's, if we just run this and ask, what is the Patronus of Harry? Just give it one second. This system is actually able to read through, read through paragraphs, read through documents, and try to contextualize words and really, let's say, um, focus in on what's really been asked for here. So with this, what is the Patronus of Harry? You can see that the system is actually able to highlight deer as an answer or uh, further down a stag, which is also correct. Um, and yeah, it's not just kind of doing the keyword matching side of things. It's also trying to isolate the parts of documents which give you the right answer. Uh, I have a other couple of questions here that we can try out, like how old is Hagrid? And here we have it. Um, yeah, ha oh, sorry, I just have to move this to the side. Yes, there we go. Um, yeah, and here we have it once again that uh, it finds the answer to this, that Hagrid is one year off turning 90. Obviously, this depends a lot on the documents that you have in your document store, because actually here, um, his age is referred to in different contexts, and these are both correct, um, but just in different contexts there. Um, I'm going to ask one more question here. This one's actually uh, dedicated to uh, Johannes, who I know is in the crowd today, um, who is a big uh, fan of Quidditch. Uh, what is Quidditch? Um, like that. Here we go. A wizarding sport played on broomsticks. Um, and yeah, so as you can see, this is a slightly different style of getting to the information you need. We're not just returning the document that's relevant. We're actually trying to hone in, hone in a little bit more on a specific phrase or, um, or even more than that, actually. There's, um, how does Fred easily die? So it's not just about key, it's not just about matching for keywords. Um, so here you can see that actually it's slightly misinterpreted in the first answer and that is just given the date uh, of death but it can actually also answer these slightly more open-ended questions and highlight not just a phrase, uh, but really like a whole explanation. This is here like a sentence or half a sentence, which kind of gives you an idea of what happened there. But uh, this can also extend to sentences, paragraphs, and so on. So yeah, I hope you get a sense here of what's kind of possible with neural search and how it's different to keyword search point I want to skip back over to the presentation and with this I want to kind of mention um, why I'm talking about neural search now why is it now that neural search is suddenly something that people are talking about and people are becoming familiar with um, and I think this has a lot to do at least from my perspective uh, from the state of NLP recently and um, as always I think everyone knows that text is unstructured data and because of that, it's quite a lot trickier to do the number crunching side of it. So you need to actually convert this kind of text to some sort of numerical or some sort of structured uh, representation in order to uh, really process it in the way that we can process things like tables or yeah, uh, numbers and so on. Um, one of the other big breakthroughs of recent times are these transformer language models. They're really like a re revelation. Um, these models are trained on large amounts of text. We're talking about, uh, it started off in the gigabytes of text, but I think we're actually past that now. We're in the, in the terabytes of text that these models read. 
And through that, they understand how words fit together, what words are likely to appear next to each other. And essentially what a lot of them do is they try to learn how to fill in blanks in your text. And that actually turns out to be a very good way to model language. And when you have a model that can do this very well, one nice effect of this is that you have a model that is also very effectively able to turn text into vectors going from, as you can see in this diagram at the top, these models take uh, paragraphs, documents, sentences, and return a set of numbers which represent the meaning of this text. Using these language models as a basis, as the fundament, uh, we can actually enable lots of different tasks. And language models are really the basis of tasks like question answering, of modern summarization, of retrieval, of translation and re-ranking. And I really don't think it's too far to say that transformer-based NLP uh, will be a part of almost every application. We're already seeing it used in Google search. I'm sure that in the example, in the demo that I showed before, some people might see that as familiar because Google now also has these question answering capabilities and it also suggests questions that you, it thinks can be answered by a certain document that is almost certainly backed by transformers. And uh, on Facebook, you can now translate so many of the comments and so many of yeah so many posts and uh, product recommendations has always been backed by machine learning but uh, transformers represent the state of the art on that front so yeah i think transformers are really going to be everywhere so i want to start off by talking about question answering and how this ties in with the demo that i just showed because what i showed there was a style of search known as question answering search and uh, to understand how we got to that point, how we were able to build this, I want to focus in a bit on the technology and also the research that made it possible. So question answering as a task within the field of NLP goes something like this. Uh, you start with a question and then you have one document. Uh, here I have the question, what is Berlin? And I have here just the start of the document that is the Wikipedia page for Berlin. And a well-trained question answering system should be able to return for you the answer the largest city of Germany. It should actually look into this document and highlight the bit of text which answers your question. And yeah, this is, uh, this, is, this is what backs that. In the latest approaches, we use something known as the reader model. People from coming from NLP will also know, know this is the question answering model. But what this does when it gets the question in the document is it actually identifies the start and end of an answer span. It really classifies every single word in your text and says, okay, I think this is where the answer starts, this is where it ends. Uh, this model is created uh, by using a language model first, but then you also further train it on question answering pairs. This really makes it uh, suited to this question answering style. And then um, very often you'll find models that are trained on a data set known as squad. It's the Stanford question answering data set. And it's become something of like a default standard for question answering. It's certainly not the only one, but it was perhaps one of the first to really do question answering to, to create examples at scale. And the kind of systems that you could build out of this um, were actually surprisingly strong. And uh, why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen earlier? Well, yeah, as I said, transformers definitely made all of this really possible. Uh, we now have a lot more hardware and a lot more um, yeah, computing power to make transformers work well. Uh, there's been a really big momentum in research. There's a lot of interest in this task and also in improving the efficiency of transformer models. And um, also we found that there's a lot of interest in having this technology applied to very real business problems. And I think that's also really driving the development of transformers, of question answering of all this technology. Going forward, I want to talk about a, um, another task, which um, from an NLP perspective, we're calling document retrieval. And uh, I think it will be clear uh, at the end of this why I'm talking about both of these and how they relate to the demo that I just showed. But document retrieval goes something like this. You start off with a question or a query. You might have something like, what kind of dog breeds are there? And then um, a retriever model should take this question, look in a big collection of documents, and return to whole documents that are relevant to this. 
And uh, yeah, what I talked about before, these keyword-based approaches, algorithms like TFIDF and BM25 are, um, are really common ways to, to do this. And it's very uh, fast, it's very lightweight, and it's actually also very, very effective. Um, this has been really kind of the backbone of a lot of search systems for quite a while now. Uh, one thing I do want to point out about this style of uh, search, though, is that it's something that we refer to as bag of words approach. This, these systems, um, you could actually jumble up text in your documents. You could totally change up the order of the words and these systems would still work. So they're actually a little bit agnostic towards sentence structure. Uh, by contrast, we have these transformer-based approaches. We have things like uh, DPR, which stands for dense passage retrieval and also sentence transformers, uh, which are actually sy syntax sensitive. You can't actually just mix up uh, the terms that are coming up in your documents. Um, it's really very, uh, it's really paying attention to this word order to understand what's in there. Uh, one downside to this is that it's going to require a lot more computing power to do both indexing and querying. So this is kind of the, this is part of the trade-off here. But uh, yeah, when we're starting to talk about transform-based approaches, which really rely on embedding text uh, it suddenly becomes very important what kind of document store we use because this can really affect the uh, the performance of the system overall and this def definitely becomes a new lever to optimize um, the performance so there are obvious there are search options like Elasticsearch or open search or sql uh, which work very well in this kind of keyword setting uh, but then there are also i also want to bring up these uh, vector optimized database options things like melvis Face and Weaviate, there are actually lots and lots of these popping up, um, but these really offer a lot of functionality to both index and save um, vectors much more quickly, but also to perform things like approximate nearest neighbors search. So the idea is maybe sometimes you don't need to have totally exact rankings. Maybe you are willing to sacrifice a tiny bit of performance for speed. Uh, these databases actually offer a lot of functionality on those lines, down those lines. So the reason why I've talked about these two tasks, document retrieval and question answering, is because that they actually dovetail together quite nicely. Um, if you want to perform question answering at scale, there are actually quite a few engineering challenges to this. And uh, part of this is to do with the nature of the reader. So a reader model, this question answering component, um, actually can only read in a limited input length. And this has big implications for speed. Uh, they're actually quite, for going through large amounts of text, the reader requires a huge amount of compute. And so often it's actually not really feasible to do this on a collection of 10,000 documents, for example. And then finally, um, the aggregation of predictions is actually also a challenge because you could apply one of these reader models to every document in your document base. But that means that you're going to have at least one answer for each document. The question then becomes, how do you pick out the best answer? That's one of these things that needs to be figured out before you can really do question answering at scale. But with a retriever and a reader, with a retriever being this model that performs document retrieval, um, we actually have a very efficient way to perform question answering on large documents uh, because the retriever acts as a much more lightweight filter that uh, let's say drops all the very clearly irrelevant documents and hand hands over a slice of candidate documents to the reader. This really reduces the amount of work that needs to be done by the reader so that it can yeah, really like focus in on um, a smaller amount of text, but with let's say like a much stronger magnifying glass. And to give some numbers on sort of what difference this can make. Um, so we actually indexed seven and a half thousand documents from the natural questions development set. Uh, we used the Roberta base model um, for our reader and a Tesla V100 GPU to accelerate this. If we were using just the reader model, on these 7,000 documents, we were looking at over three hours for one query. But if we put a retriever in before it, we can actually take query time down to something in the range of half a second to two seconds uh, with only 
a small, a negligible bump uh, drop in performance. So yeah, um, I hope that intuitively you can see how, how useful um, this kind of technology is. I hope some of you are maybe even a little bit excited about it because I think it's actually really cool just how powerful and flexible uh, this, kind of, this kind of task is. But of course, I think with any kind of technology, it's always really important to ask, how can I use it? What problems can it solve? And um, we've seen a lot. We've seen actually, it's actually really interesting to us to see how many of our community members come to us and describe to us a problem which can be solved with question answering, but maybe in a way that we didn't think about initially. But I wanna talk here just about some of the uh, more popular cases and then also mention one that's maybe a little bit more experimental, but has actually seen some good first results. So um, what I showed with the demo earlier was a knowledge base search. Maybe um, you have a large textual knowledge base and you want to ask questions and get answers. You return sections of text as your answers. And this is really, really good for um, any, any enterprise, any company which has a big collection of documents, whether they be technical documentation or contracts or um, whatever it might be, just unorganized collections of text. Um, it's proven to be really useful there already. One other way to use question answering is actually in a style like information extraction. So you might have an incoming stream of documents with similar content, and maybe you want to ask the same question, the same set of standard questions on each one of these documents and return one answer for each document. And we see that this has actually been uh, yeah, really requested from users who are working perhaps with something like patents. You have patents which all have a very similar structure, um, similar, I wouldn't say similar content, but at least similar, yeah, similar style. Um, and you might just want to extract certain things, certain questions are relevant to all of these. So that's really useful there. And also on legal documents, just anything which really fits a certain like repeated structure or style or yeah, something like that. And the slightly more experimental uh, usages that I want to flag here is what we know as zero shot usages. So I think some of you might be familiar with this task NER, named entity recognition. So if you have um, some text, you might want to um, figure out what are the proper names in there. You might want to extract Harry Potter or the company BMW or something like that. And there are models which specifically do this. But I want to flag here that actually we've seen some success uh, using question answering models to do NER because you can kind of tweak it a bit. If you, if you tweak this prompt, tweak this question and ask something like which company manufactures electric vehicles, that's kind of a form of NER. The, the results that it returns should be companies and actually even more specific than that, it should be companies that manufacture electric vehicles. Um, and one of the nice things about this, what makes it zero shot is that you don't need to train it for specific categories. You don't need to show it examples of um, yeah, electric vehicle companies or something like that. The way that you have to define your classes when you train an NER model. Uh, this is what the zero shot side of it refers to. One other uh, usage that we've been playing around with is entity relation. So let's say you've already performed uh, NER and you found BMW as a company. Um, for those who are familiar with uh, knowledge graph databases, you know that you want to have your data represented in these relational triples. So you might have something like, you know, uh, Harry Potter is in relation son to uh, James Potter. Uh, if you have one of the entities ready and you know what sort of relation you're looking for, you can turn this into a question. Why don't you ask something like, who are the partners of BMW? And if the answer there is another entity, then there you're a step towards creating a relational triple. So yeah, uh, we found that this technology is really cool, really flexible. Um, and yeah, I really encourage everyone to just get hands on with it and see what you can do with it. So one way of getting hands on with question answering then is a uh, Haystack, this repository that we've been working on. And uh, I want to just give a little bit of an idea of what's possible here and what, how we've designed it and uh, yeah, what, what our focus is there. So as I've mentioned, um, our Haystack is a fully open source NLP framework. We cover all of the core NLP tasks, but we have a little bit of a sort of a focus on search cases. 
Um, and we're definitely very production focused. We're building systems which will scale, which can be yeah, put to production and also can be served. And uh, we're interested in everything uh, from databases to um, yeah, the REST API and also all the quality of life features in between that make it easy to work with. One thing to notice here is that we have an integration with the Hugging Face Model Hub. Those of you who are uh, in come from at least a little bit of machine learning background, probably know about the Hugging Face Transformers library. This is really um, the, dominant, the dominant implementation of all Transformers nowadays. And they also offer uh, the ability to upload models to their hub. And this means that actually there are lots and lots of models out there which you can simply just download and start using within Haystack. That's not just for reader models or retriever models. We also have, we also have support for lots of the other different um, tasks like translation and summarization, which I'll mention a little bit more later on. Um, and yeah, as I said, it's it's end to end. We're really not just about the models. We um, <clears throat> we really want uh, people to recognize that, like yeah, that we provide all the connectors between components so that you can chain together and build um, yeah flexible systems. And we have a lot of these efficient storage options and their quality of life features for all users. Actually, I'll just uh, maybe point out here, like uh, the, the pipeline that we have, this diagram um, that, yeah, this is like just a representation of a common workflow that we have that people often start off by indexing through Haystack where we've got features like file converters. We've got pre-processes for splitting up documents. You use that to index into your document store. And based on that document store, you want to start doing your search where you might be using in a most basic sense, a, a retriever and a reader to get an answer. And uh, this is an example of a hello world uh, code in Haystack. Um, this is actually, this actually shows a lot of the concepts we've been talking about just now. So in the first line, we're just going to start up a, an elastic search document store. This connects to the instance that's running in behind. And with that, uh, we want to initialize a retriever. Here, we've, we've got an elastic search retriever, which is uh, the BM25 algorithm connected to the document store now. And then we want to create the reader model. As you can see there, there is an argument for the model name of path. And uh, by providing that name, uh, you yeah, choose the model that you're using. And I just want to iterate, uh, reiterate here that uh, you can actually just here provide the name of a model on the Hugging Face Hub and if you provide it there, uh, it will actually download it and uh, allow you to start using it within Haystack. We want to stick these things together in something known as a pipeline. And this is really the connector between the components. So you can see that we have an extractive question answering pipeline where we put together retriever and reader. And then we're ready to run some predictions. We call pipe.run and provide our query and we'll have an answer, this prediction. And if we wanna see what that looks like, it would be like this. So uh, this is for the Game of Thrones fans out there. Um, if you ask a question like, who is the father of Arya Stark? You're going to get a list of answers. And uh, you can see the top answer there is Eddard, which is correct. And it also shows you the context around this answer so that you can actually read through and verify that this is actually really what you're looking for. And um, yeah, Haystack's able to also return to you multiple candidate answers uh, ranked on how confident it is for each one. Um, yeah, as I said, we have a coverage of a lot of the NLP tasks. Uh, I've talked already about the reader and retriever, but I also want to mention that we have nodes which do things like question generation. You can provide a document and get it to return to you questions that it thinks it can answer. We have a summarizer, we have a ranker, uh, we have a generator, which is actually something that works quite like the reader. Um, I'm actually going to explain a little bit more about that a little bit later in this talk. Uh, we also have a classifier. So every document that you've indexed, you might want to classify as being part of a certain category uh, or not. And this can form a very useful metadata for you to later use to filter out certain documents. And uh, we also have a query classifier which looks at the, uh, how the query is written, sees whether it's a full sentence question or whether it's just keywords. And you can use that to route to the right path to uh, have the most efficient processing. 
Uh, in Haystack, we also provide a lot of data connectors. So uh, as I mentioned, we have file converters and we have the preprocessor. File converters are used so that you can actually provide documents that are in TXT format, or we have uh, OCR to read PDFs, or you can even provide docx or markdown files. And we can convert that into the format that Haystack works with. There's also a web scraper so that you can turn a website into text very quickly. And uh, we also have this preprocessor, which is used to split up long documents for optimization purposes. It can also clean text so that it's a little bit more normalized. And as I've already mentioned, there's a lot of different document stores. Uh, in Haystack, we have support for Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, SQL, Feist, Milvis, Weavy8, amongst others. Yeah. Um, but one feature that I really want to focus in on here is pipelines. This is really what connects together components. This is really like the glue of the framework because pipelines allow for the easy routing of queries through different nodes. Um, it's really forming like a computational graph and a node is sort of a, a component which does some sort of processing. When you can see in that diagram there that we have uh, different nodes here joined up together and there's a certain flow for how data goes through it. Uh, we've also designed pipelines in a way so that they allow for very for you to very easily set up your own custom routing. Uh, you can really route things however you want, so long as different components are compatible. And um, there's definitely a way to do this in Python to define your pipeline. But we've actually heard also from a lot of people who are interested in deployment that uh, you want to be able to configure a pipeline just in a standalone file, in a YAML file, so that you might have uh, different pipeline styles all with a different file of their own it becomes a very easy way to kind of switch and test different ones and to compare. So that's all possible within Haystack. But uh, here I want to just show an example of a custom pipeline. Um, we already saw before this kind of classic uh, document store to a retriever to a reader kind of pipeline. We're doing something a little bit more complicated here in that the first node we have is the query classifier. As I said, it will um, differentiate between full sentence questions and just keyword um, keyword queries. And the reason we do this is because certain retrievers are actually more suited to one style or the other. A dense retriever, a lot of the modern dense retrievers are trained in a way that they expect a full question. Whereas these keyword style ones might actually work a bit better um, with a keyword retriever with an algorithm like TFIDF or VM25. So depending on what style the query is in, it will be passed on to one of these two nodes and the output of that retriever, whichever retriever it goes to, will be then passed on to the reader to then find the answer. Um, yeah, it really allows for a lot of flexibility. It really allows for a lot of optimization and it was a feature that was really requested from a lot of our community and we see a lot of use out of it. So um, yeah, we're really, this is really kind of core to how we see Haystack and how it's really about being the glue between components rather than any one model. Um, I think that one other really nice uh, side effect of having this pipeline design is that it becomes very easy to perform distributed computing. It becomes very easy to scale nodes. So Ray, uh, some of you might be familiar with this Python library. Uh, it's now implemented in Haystack pipelines to allow you to, uh, to set up each node on a separate server, to have its own hardware to run. And uh, the beauty of this is that if you do some analysis of your system and you find that there's one node, which is really the bottleneck and it's really taking up a lot more time and it's slowing down your whole system, this distributed style allows you to create replicas of nodes so that you can speed it up so that you could have perhaps five machines running the reader instead of just one so that it's no longer a bottleneck. This is the flexibility to give you the speed and optimization that you might need. And uh, yeah, so there are a lot of different tasks that are supported in, um, in Haystack. And I think that we're gonna get to a point that search is not just one thing, that I think we're really coming to a point where there's gonna be a want to customize your search, to have your search really tailored to a certain use case, not just in terms of the data, in terms of the model that you use, but also how you want it transformed in various ways. So one really popular way we see here is through summarization. 
uh, transformer-based summarization has become really, really good. And I want to stress that it's abstractive summarization, not extractive. So um, there's a style of summarization called extractive summarization, where you basically just highlight some of the most important sentences. Um, it isn't able to actually form a whole a new sentence that synthesizes uh, two sentences or two bits of information. By contrast, abstractive summarization, which is what transformers are doing, uh, reads through the given text and then really kind of composes the summary word by word. It's not something that has occurred in the documents before, and this allows for a lot of flexibility um, because it allows it to do things like count how many entities were mentioned. It can turn like a list of items into an actual number in your summary. The power, like really, I, I really want to stress that um, like these summary, these summarization models have gotten really, really good. And uh, Google Pegasus uh, is one of these models that was really a big breakthrough in this field. And um, in their blog, they stated that human raters do not consistently prefer the human summaries to those from our model. Uh, some of you might have also heard about this one paper where they created a summarization model. Um, they, there's an abstract at the front, which uh, you only realize at the end that was the abstract is, was actually generated by the summarization model that they created. And when I first read through it, I, I thought it was written by human. I really couldn't tell. I really couldn't tell. So we're kind of at that point where summarization is really feasible. It's really practical. And I can see that in a lot of use cases, that's going to be something that that end users want. Um, there's also the support for translation within a haystack. Once again, really good performance with transformer based translation. Um, there are lots and lots of open source models out there. If you look on the transformers model hub, uh, you'll see that there's almost something like 1400 models that are open source that you can download just by providing that name, just by slotting it in there. Um, and it's already embedded into a lot of programs that uh, I think all of us use in a day to day that um, Google Translate obviously has it, but um, I think you'll see it embedded into product descriptions in Amazon. And also it's, you're always given that option, say on Facebook, when you read a, a comment or a thread. And uh, just one more task I'll talk about here, re-ranking. Uh, we have support for re-ranking within Haystack, once again, transformer based. And um, the idea is that uh, when you get answers from the retriever, they might not always be very well ordered. Maybe your top result is not the most relevant one. The re-ranker is used so that it performs a closer reading on this subset of documents that come from the retriever and it pushes the relevant documents to the top. Um, and yeah, once again, it gives a lot of flexibility and efficiency and performance. And so uh, I want to finish off by talk by looking forward a bit and seeing where search can go into the future. Um, what I see as being a really big field coming up is generative question answering. So um, in the example that I showed with the retriever and the reader, uh, that's something known as extractive QA. Um, it is used to condense information, uh, sorry, it's used in a way where it highlights information that's relevant to your question, but it isn't really able to do anything like merging sources of information. What if you have to combine two bits to come up with your final answer? Um, you might've seen that there are some um, models out there like GPT-3, these kind of giant super language models um, which do some pretty clever things and are able to answer a lot of questions in the QA realm. But we've always found that there's a bit of an issue there in that these models don't really have a lot of explainability. Once they give the answer, you don't really know what it's basing it off of, what it's, yeah, what's its reasons for picking this answer. Um, and it's actually really hard to use one of these models for a specific domain because you're not allowed to, you can't, it's not feasible for anyone to adapt this super massive model to their use case. And uh, it can be really expensive to run these super giant models. So one of the solutions that we found that sort of, yeah, is able to overcome some of these issues with extractive QA and also these super massive um, models is generative question answering. Um, in generative question answering, this generator, which, replace, which replaces the reader, has access to external data 
uh, which is like the documents that you have, but also internal data, which is uh, what it's read in the past. And um, yeah, this really allows for like, how it works is that it reads through say five candidate documents, and then like the summarizer, will word by word uh, compose an answer that hopefully synthesizes all the most important bits of information. And some examples of this include uh, retrieval augmented generation, RAG, uh, or long form question answering, LFQA, both of which uh, you can actually already start playing around with in Haystack. And uh, if you want to start with long form question answering, uh, this is what the hello world of LFQA looks like. Once again, here we have a document store, but this time we're using the Feist document store, which is much better for working with vectors. We have something known as an embedding retriever, which performs retrieval uh, using yeah, an embedding, like a, a transformer to embed text. And then you have the generator on top, the sequence to sequence generator. And uh, you glue it together with the pipeline and you can start asking questions. Um, we, we, this was actually an initiative from um, one of our community members, Vladimir Blagojevich, and he's created actually a really, really cool tutorial and also a blog to go with it. And if you follow it, what it actually guides you through is actually indexing a slice of Wikipedia and then being able to ask a question and have an answer returned in the style of uh, ELI5. For those of you who are familiar with Reddit, this is explain it like I'm five. Um, whereby people ask a question and um, other users have to give like a layman's explanation. Uh, you can do that with LFQA on Wikipedia. It's really cool. So I really encourage everyone to try it out if you're interested. And uh, to finish off, I wanna talk about why you should start using NLP today. So um, yeah, I really think that like, it's a really super exciting time to be working with NLP and I think that language is going to become the interface to all kinds of data and to be the interface to the kinds of data that we didn't really associate with language before. So it's already possible to ask questions on table data. Google released a model known as Tapas to do the question answering side of it. Um, in Haystack, actually, we've recently just merged a PR, which uh, also performs table retrieval alongside table question answering. So we now have support for doing this kind of search, this neural search on tables. Uh, something that was really requested from various community members who we've been working with. And also the link between text data and image data uh, has become closer than ever. Some of you might have seen DALI. And this is a model that was released, which where you could give a text prompt, you can see on the right there at the top, and then it will actually generate an image off of that. And in this example, uh, the prompt is an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And this model was able to create images. I wanna stress that these are not things that were stored in it and existed before. It actually generated these images to be new images of some sort of avocado chair. Wonderful, I love it. Um, and yeah, I think that NLP is gonna fundamentally impact how we interact with computers. I think um, I really want to try to encourage people to really think about search in more flexible ways in, in not just returning a document, but really being able to find an answer or to get a summary. Um, in the future, I think it's also gonna be like a conversation that you might start with a search query or a question and you might be asked to refine it or asked to disambiguate between certain meanings. Um, I think that really, is coming in the really near future. There are a lot of people working on conversational QA. There are a lot of data sets and there's a lot of research around multi-hop style question answering. And finally, uh, I'm very convinced that every enterprise tech stack is going to have a semantic layer. Um, just the power, just the like what you can do if you are able to embed your text through a transformer uh, can really like improve how you search. I think that we're gonna to get to a point where it makes sense to just embed all your text. You should just embed all your text because it makes it so much more accessible. This is a new way of indexing um, that you should really perform embedding to create a vector that becomes much more searchable than just raw text. Um, as I showed already, summarization is already very possible to do now. And I think that, that only makes it easier for users to get to the text they want and to understand which documents they're looking at. And um, 
Yeah, it's already, you can already start asking full sentence questions rather than this keyword style query that we've become used to. And I think this is gonna allow for um, much more specified queries, much more like specific data that you're looking for. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but a lot of the times when I'm sort of asking um, for like travel guide for like, you know, what are the visa restrictions for someone going from say Australia to the UK? Um, if you just put in these keywords, um, your system might not know whether you're a UK citizen going to Australia or whether you're an Australian citizen going to the UK. And with this full sentence question answering style, that can be disambiguated. So I think this is a really big jump forward. And I uh, really believe that this is gonna uh, gain widespread adoption. So this is why I'm in this area and this is why we've been working on Haystack. And uh, I hope that that was interesting and informative to you all. That was, um, yeah, if you guys wanna follow up on any of this, they said Haystack is open source and you guys can already start using it and playing around with it. We have a big set of tutorials. We also have a Slack channel, which is very active. We're open to all kinds of questions. Very happy to talk about anything neural search related. And uh, once again, also uh, we're hiring. So if you're a backend engineer or a developer advocate, we'd love to have a chat with you. Um, but yeah, apart from all that, thanks so much for listening today. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Brandon, thank you so much. Uh, it was fascinating stuff. And I love to put it in context with all the other uh, methods of search and retrieval. That was a great place to start. So we do have some questions from our, um, our audience, if you wouldn't mind. So um, first off, Mark asks, are there any additional benefits when using any of the vector optimized data stores as compared to using any of the standard ones like OpenSearch? Mm -hmm. um so open search has actually been trying to, uh, they've actually been implementing more features to allow for vector optimized search. They actually recently allowed for approximate nearest neighbor search, which is a really cool step. But as I understand it, the, um, this sort of elastic search, um, open search, uh, the way that they create their indexes is actually not uh, fully optimized for, um, let's say like this kind of like similarity search style. Um, so, what we saw was that like open search's steps did speed things up, but it still lags behind options like Milvus and uh, Fice, which are really properly optimized for uh, yeah for for embeddings. It, this is like particularly clear when you're actually doing the query when you have an embedding for the query and you want to find the closest um, text embeddings. Yeah, that's, it's really noticeable there. Okay. So uh, the, 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 it's a matter of optimization and you get better performance with the um, vector optimized ones? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Amrit asks, how do the extractive QA models perform on questions that are slightly inferential in nature? Um, I'm kind of wondering what you mean by inferential, but maybe I can try to interpret it and you can, if you want to comment further or clarify, uh, feel free to type a comment. Right, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question yourself, please please do. Sure, Charlie. Uh, yeah, Brandon, my question hmm. was, uh, when you said that extractive is mostly, uh, you know, trying to find the answer span, right? Mm -hmm. But there could be instances where, uh, I mean, you are trying to deduce something out of the context. You may not have the exact answer lying around there. I think it's similar to what you mentioned about uh, generator, probably something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's worth looking um, at the squad data set to understand sort of what these models excel at. And squad is really tailored towards, let's say, uh, factoid questions. Questions where the answer is maybe just a, like a standalone phrase or, um, or a word or a sentence where the full explanation for why this is the answer sort of occurs quite close to it. So it, there's just different levels of sort of difficulty. If it's that you have to like, let's say like read every line of a long document and remember what was at the very beginning before you can extract like the answer at the very end, this is possible, but it's also much more challenging for an extractive model. Um, I think that there's definitely uh, potential for that to improve. And I actually think that the most potential to improve in this style of question answering uh, will come from the generative models. So that's definitely the space to watch. Um, yeah. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Hope that answered your question, Amrit. So uh, Leon asks, um, is asking about uh, user intent capture and understanding. Uh, Brandon, do you have any thoughts on that? 
user intent capture. Um, can you clarify maybe a bit on what you mean by intent here? I, I've heard of it also in the, in the context of like chatbots. Um, well, I, I think I think for user intent, we're talking about you know, are you are you intending to buy something or you're just researching something? Uh, mm. Are you are you just looking for uh, information or do there's some kind of action? Yeah, Charlie, I, I can explain here. Sure. Let's say if there were a content content server, we give them we give different personas, different things. For example, marketers okay. versus sellers. Mm -hmm. And right now we use a back backwards approach. People translate what they want in the back of words, it is hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they know they want to search for the exact document they want. Sometimes it's just exploratory, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, interested in NLP, you know, potentially can help us capture the intent better. Um, we don't know, we want to hear some opinions. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I really like that idea. Um, I think that this, this reminds me a bit of sort of what I was talking about with the query classifier. I wonder whether you could uh, at a very early stage, just by looking at the query, get some idea of sort of what the intent of the user is. In a more advanced version, I could imagine you could also sort of store some understanding of their previous queries, perhaps, uh, and form a little bit of kind of a narrative out of that. Um, and I think that if you had like a classifier that could say, okay, the user is asking this question because of they're just looking, they're really exploring for different options, I could imagine you kind of piping that to a pipeline, which, um, maybe returns less granular answers, returns more documents, returns more things. Uh, whereas if you think that they're really looking for a specific piece of information, you would pipe it to this reader retriever style whereby you would return and highlight an answer. Um, that's kind of how I imagine it might be worked. But um, to be honest, I haven't, this hasn't been uh, the style of query classification I've seen so far, but I could definitely see it happening in that sort of a way. Thank you, Brandon, which is leads to explanation and leads to my next question, which is, you know, for companies right now, say, have a back, back of words approach for, for search. Mm -hmm. How do you incrementally take advantage of NLP to make the search better, right? You know, instead of mm -hmm. switching to NLP overnight, which you, you can't, how, how mm -hmm. can you go there step by step? Um, are you saying that from, from like a, an implementation point of view or sort of like a, you don't want to switch over straight away because you're not sure sort of how the performance might change over time. I will say both. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, at least in the latter half, um, I think that like with this pipeline design, there's also the potential to wait. So like what I showed there was actually that a query gets passed either to a keyword retriever or to a dense retriever uh, with yeah, this NLP power. Um, there's actually another way to implement this whereby every query is passed on to both. And so you can have your existing pipeline, you can have your existing querying uh, with, yeah, with TFIDF or BM25, but you can also pass it to the dense side. And then both of these should have a score and you could choose to weight them. And maybe, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of experimentation you can do to see sort of how to optimally weight it. But also if you're a bit cautious about switching over too quickly, you can only, you could choose to just sort of lightly weight the NLP side and then incrementally bump it up until um, you're at a point where you're happy. Thanks so much, Brandon. Fantastic, thanks for your question, Leon. Um, so a uh, quick one for you is, uh, who was asking this one? I think it's uh, Zhao was asking, is Feistor in the example uh, mainly in memory? Is it mainly in memory? As in, um, so yeah, we have Feist supported. It's a Python package, which means that you don't actually start a separate service uh, for it. And it only persists as long as your script runs. So this is, you know, in contrast to like Elasticsearch where you start its own service, you connect to it with, through Haystack, uh, even when the Haystack script is done, Elasticsearch survives and it stays there. Uh, in Haystack, Feist is not implemented that way. Once Feist, so once yeah, once you're done with the Haystack code, it will disappear. You can, okay. however, you can save it uh, and you can load it again another time. So that if you do rerun this, um, yeah, you can have it all there. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, where are we? Oh yes, Michael Upshaw asked a question. Um, what's your business model? Who pays for this functionality at DeepSet? Sure, yeah, absolutely. 
So um, we, so yeah, this is our open core offering, uh, Haystack, the repository, it's open source, it's free. Um, we have done a lot of projects with various people in industry, uh, which has um, yeah, been, been very helpful for us. But in the long term, uh, that's not really our main focus. We're building a product on top as well. Um, it's a SaaS offering, and it's a hosted version of, uh, of Haystack. But um, what we found is that we give all the tools that's, that are needed to do everything that you might want to train, to evaluate. Um, that's in open core, it's all gonna be open source. But there's a lot of need for guidance of how to handle the project. So you might have a lot of different users, a lot of different um, annotators. Um, a lot of the times, a lot of people come here as a developer and maybe don't really know the full sort of training um, process. Like, what do I start with? How do I evaluate? How do I know if this is getting better? Um, our, our product is actually a way to guide enterprises through this uh, all the way from, yeah, evaluating, should I add more labels to comparing different models to deploying it? Um, so yeah, that's really, that's really where we see our, our revenue streams coming from. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm just having a quick look through the, the questions. We have a few uh, people discussing the fact that ANN is coming to Elasticsearch. Thank you, Josh, uh, obviously built on uh, Lucene. Lucene also has some other things uh, in the vector space coming. Uh, and yeah, uh, some uh, yeah, I think that's about all the questions we have at the moment. Does anybody have, do you have any final questions from Bra for Brandon? Do just type them in the Zoom now, please. Obviously, I can't hear you typing because you're all on mute, but. Um... Last chance for your questions. OK. Well, I think I think that's that's everything for now. Um, thank you very much, Brandon, for your talk. Um, let's all check out the, uh, the GitHub. Let's check out uh, the tutorials and uh, I wish you the very best of, uh, of luck with DeepSet. It sounds like a fascinating project. Awesome. Um, Thanks so much for having me. You're and, very welcome. Um, I will also send over the slides so that everyone can uh, have access to those afterwards. Okay, okay. So we've just got uh, another uh, quick uh, set of announcements here. So uh, if you can all see that. Um, our next talk will be on December the 16th. So just before the Christmas break, hopefully, you won't have all uh, left by then. You'll be uh, waiting for another Haystack talk. Uh, this will be from um, Dimitri Khan and Daniel uh, Warner of Silo.ai. They're going to be talking about uh, five ways to increase search result diversity in a web scale search engine. Um, we do need more talks. If you have a talk or you know someone who could give a talk or someone you could nudge or bully into giving a talk, please go to the Haystack website and submit one. There is a form link on the right of haystackconf.com, which will, uh, and then we'll try and schedule you. We do these about every three or four weeks if we can. As I mentioned earlier, we have three trainings scheduled for early next year uh, at OSC. Uh, do check out our trainings. And if you're not already in relevant Slack, well, we've got over 2000 search people in there. Please do join in. Um, there's channels and everything from vector search to elastic search to product management. There's even a jobs channel. Jump in and join us. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, so uh, lastly, just to thank Brandon again for his time. And uh, we're Open Source Connections, where they search relevance people. And we're very happy to host the Haystack Live Meetup. And we'll see you all again here, back again sometime soon. Thank you. <laughs>